mute it. You are muted, play Alt A. Do not. He has an unmuted. Now can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right. Yes. Excellent. Can you see me? Can you see me now? Yes, I can. And can you see the people in the park? Yes, up to Bonnie. If there are more, then we can't see the rest. <laughs> Very good. All right. Hello, hello. I'm told that the camera view includes Bonnie. So if you want to be off camera, you're on camera. That's what they call so many of my classes, watching Rabbi Tobin eat lunch. That's what a lot of people call my Tobin class. Well, with the price of gasoline, I was saying I'm not going to ride my car around town for little errands. So I'm on the bike. It's a beautiful day. All right, let me hand out the materials and we will get started. Today is session three of Kabbalah in the Park. Thrilled to have you with me. For those of you who are online, you can Google an image of the 10 Sifirot, S-E-F-I-R-O-T. We're gonna finish that. And today we're gonna to talk about creation, how the Kabbalah saw the creation. And if we get to it, we're going to start to anticipate next week, we're going to talk about good and evil and the meaning of life. So we're getting there. We're still covering all the underlying materials, though. You brought your own, that's good. Yeah, I have brought you. Is it the same? It's the same, same. Oh, I have one. Here we go. You have one? You have one? You're looking for something that looks like this on the web. All right. So we're we're almost at the point where we're gonna can Are everybody hear me? All right. So I have people in my ears, so I, if it looks like I'm talking to myself, don't worry. I haven't slipped entirely yet. Um Okay, we're almost at the point where we're going to stop talking about history and dates, um, but I will let you know again where we stand. Two foundational books of Kabbalah, the Sefer Yitzirah and the Sefer Habahir. They're both done by the 11th, 12th century of the Common Era. They're not earlier really than the 10th. Uh, the Bahir is not earlier than the 10th, um, and it's in Provence in southern France. It, the south, southeastern corner of France and the northeastern corner of Spain was for a while a kingdom in uh, what you would call the, the Dark Ages. There really was never a Dark Ages in the Mediterranean basin. Northern Europe had a Dark Ages. Um, the reason the Mediterranean basin didn't have a Dark Ages was because of the influence of Islam, that the southern half and the western shores were Muslim for many uh, centuries and Islam never had a dark angels. They had science and, uh, and philosophy and art and poetry and you name it. So the Jewish communities that were introspective and philosophical and all of that were mostly influenced by the philosophical schools that had been preserved through Islam. Um, and the Jewish community penetrated those into Europe in a variety of ways. So. The Moors were one of those civilizations. Yes, they were in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, okay, so the Sefer Bahir talks about 10 Sefirot, but it doesn't develop this system. This system uh, really is a creation of the 15th and 16th centuries. So you've got the Zohar by Moses de Leon, and then immediately 
following, overlapping the work of the Zohar. You have Moses Cordovero in Spain in the 1500s, and he writes a lot of important works. He's quoting and talking exactly about Sefer Yitzirah, which he believes is an ancient text, and he, he quotes it and he deals with it extensively, and he quotes Sefer Habahir. Um, concurrent with him, and overlapping just slightly later, is Isaac Luria, who is the winner of the Kabbalah sweepstakes of history. He's the guy whose work winds up being the definitive work of Kabbalah as we know it today. But Cordovero is in there as well, and, and the Zohar is the base text. So it's like saying Mishnah is the base text, but the Talmud is what everybody studies. The Zohar is the base, te base text, but the, the writings of the Ari, who is Isaac Luria, and his students, um, who become, in many cases, the progenitors of the major schools of Hasidism, the major Hasidic schools and communities are founded by followers of a school of thought from the Ari. Okay, so he is tremendously influential. Um, he's the one who really, really, really develops the coherent system of the Sifi Um If we look at the top of the chart, the the top of it is Keter and Ein Sof. So we talked about how the Ein Sof is understood as a eternal, infinite, timeless, overflowing, emanating God. Totally inaccessible to us, either through philosophy or prayer or anything. Completely inaccessible to us. However, also, because of this philosophy, constantly and always in a direct connection with us, and this is the power of the Kabbalistic system, is that the infinite, unknowable, unreachable God through overflowing is constantly in contact with every particle and bit of matter, spirit, soul, thought, truth, good, evil, everything you've lived right down to the sandwich you're munching or the pen in your hand is in contact with God infinitely, eternally, essentially, and always. Okay, so there's a connectedness to God. There's a tethering of the world to God through the Sifirot. Okay, so the Sifirot are like the rope between the boat and the anchor. Okay, and, and God's the boat, the source of all energy, but God is also anchored to the world. Okay, um, so this happens in Keter. This is done by a process of creation that we're going to get into today. How you get from the non physical God to the physical world you're sitting on. Um, means at some point there's a change. There's a, a bridging of that gap. Wh whoever's online moving around a lot, could you please mute? If everyone online could please mute or I'm going to have to remove the headphones from my ears because it's terribly disconcerting. I think that worked. Thank you. I'm really hoping that was someone online and that it's not just sounds in my head. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for that. So the overflowing has to eventually result in a physicality. Otherwise, God is in part physical, which would mean God is in part limited. If something is physical, it, it's only so big, right? It's measurable and therefore limited and therefore not infinite. So that can't be God. On the other hand, how does a completely um, a, a complete soul, a complete thinking, a complete non-physical abstract being create something like they don't have a hand to do that where does it come from right and where does it come from is the secret of creation okay now in in rabbinic thought classical rabbinic literature um there's a lot of stories about creation because we've got a number of them in the tanakh we've got the in the beginning God went to create the heaven and the earth, 
the spirit of God was hovering over the waters, the deep, the abyss, however you want to translate tohu vavohu. So the spirit of God is mirachefet, hovering, agitating back and forth over the faces of the waters and God, the, the earth being unformed and void. Most people forget that those first couple of sentences and they go right to, and God said, let there be light and there was light and it was good. And he separated the light from the dark, right? And you go through this very intentional, willful um, creation story with no opposition to the power of God. There's not a battle that God wins. There's not a struggle that God endures. It's just God said it and it happened. God said this and it happened. God said this and it happened. The first thing that opposes God is man. Right? So there's no opposition to God in God's universe in the classic story. Therefore, everything is as God wills it. There is nothing in the universe that is not as God would will it to be. Now, do any of those things kind of move mechanically on their own? Is he causing every snowflake to fall and melt exactly where it falls and melts? That's a whole nother level we're not gonna get at. We wanna get at how do snowflakes come to be, right? And the simple rabbinic answer is, at the spoken will of God, period. In Pirkei Avot, it says, God created the world with 10 divarim, which is un understood to mean 10 words, which means 10 utterings, 10 speakings. And if you go through and you say, how many times in the creation story does it say, Vayomer, he said, there's 10 of them. So that's that. Very simple, very straightforward. They don't want to get into battles about the metaphysics of it. The rabbis just say it's the will of God. However, in Tractate Chagiga at the age of the Mishnah, again, this is the second century of the Common Era, there's also a weird prohibition. Ein dorshin b'masei breshi. We're not allowed to talk about the deeds of creation except with two. In other words, I'm not supposed to meet with a group this large and talk about God's creation, how God created. I'm supposed to pull a couple of you aside and have a very private session on that. You can imagine there's a lot of ink that's been spilt to try and explain and understand why that pro prohibition would be in place. There's a lot of ink that's been spilt on trying to understand why that prohibition has been placed. The next line, the ain the Merkava, you can't talk about the chariot, right? Even with one or unless he knows it according to his own wisdom. And him, you can only teach Roshe Prakim, chapter headings, period. So you have this pro double level prohibition. By the way, the first one, there's three in the list. Number, the first one is sexual laws, in, is the group of three. What's that? This is in the Mishnah, in Tractate Hagiga of the Mishnah, second century authoritative work of, of mainstream rabbinic Judaism. So what I'm saying is that there's an ancient prohibition about who you can talk to about what. And the details of creation seems to be a very sensitive topic that you're not supposed to expound on for some reason, the rabbi and only with a couple of people. And then the Merkava, which for them must mean the vision of Ezekiel of the heavenly chariot. But for us, we also know alludes to everything like that. All the weird stuff, right? All the heavenly host stuff. Only one. And then if they really already understand it by themselves, and even then you can only give them these hints like the beginning of the chapter. Like you'll find that answer in this chapter. If you put it together with this chapter and this chapter, you'll get it. And for most of us, no. We don't get to study that stuff. What's that? Rabbi Huda Nasi was the editorial chief of the Mishnah. 
who individually determines that? I guess the chief rabbi of whatever yeshiva or community you're in. But he's talking to Dorshim, the people who are Darshanim, the people who teach Torah. He's not talking in that case to students. So he's probably talking about, in his world, he thought he was talking to the rabbis, right? When Rabbi Yunanasi was creating the Mishnah, he had a school of rabbis around him. And he knew that there were rabbis and there were students of rabbis and there were friends and there were ignoramuses. And those are the categories that he divided the world into. The Chacham, the Talmid Chacham, the Chaver, and the Am Haaretz. Suffice to say, we're Am Haaretz. We're not elevating very high in his list of people, right? It would have been a very select group in that sense. Um, okay, so we, we have this concept that the rabbinic system doesn't like to talk about these things. On the other hand, in the Middle Ages, the philosophical system, of Maimonides and the Kabbalah system of the Zohar and the Ari almost want to talk about nothing else. This is the crux of their entire belief system, how this came to be and how this works. So Maimonides in the Guide of the Perplexed is talking about whether or not the world always existed, was created out of stuff and junk that was chaos and turned into order, or whether um, it was created out of nothing. He, by the way, believes that it, whichever way it came into being, it will last forever perfectly according to the emanating overflow of God, which he believes is intellect. The intellect that is God overflowing and informing the world of truths in an eternal perfection. That's his belief. The Kabbalah has to answer the same question, and they also have an emanating God. But they have an emanating God who doesn't just emanate pure intellect. They have an emanating God that winds up in this, this system of sefirot. So they have God kind of dividing without dividing, because this is not a physical system. The sefirot are not globes. You can't like pull back from the universe and look down and see globes of Keter and a globe of Chokhmah. They're not physical. But the physical world winds up down here below Malchut. When the divine system phallically penetrates into the lower world through the Yesod into the female of Malchut and Shekhinah, and the female receives that, in, you know, that seminal energy, and here we are, right? So the creation story in the Kabbalah is going to have to both create the sefirot and create the world from the sefirot. Okay. So when we talked about them having aspects of divinity, chokhmah is wisdom, bina is understanding. You also have in the creation story the concept that opposites are being created. There's light and darkness, dry land and water, male from female, right? You have a series of things that are separated one from the other that are neither opposites nor irrelevant to each other. They are pairs that complement each other. Did God create the light out of the darkness? And the, and right? Or did God create the light and the darkness together? It says he created light. And he separated light from darkness. Was there darkness before light? Or can there only be darkness if there is light? Is there such a thing as darkness if there's not such a thing as light? So prior to the creation of light, could darkness exist? But then why didn't it say, and he created darkness? So th for the philosopher, that's easy. He created light, at which point we came to understand that any place where there is not light, the absence of that light is understood as something we call darkness. Not so for the Kabbalah. That darkness takes on a life of its own, equivalent to and in relationship with light. 
In the creation of light, there is a darkness created, or light would have no meaning. And so when you get into the system and you have Chochmah on one side and Bina on the other, Chesed on one side and Gevura on the other, that's going to parallel in the Kabbalistic creation stories with the separation of opposites in the creation story itself. Okay? So they're going to wind up being paired. They're, if you're a Star Wars fan, they're dyads in the force. Anyone with me? It was an esoteric part of the last three movies that made no sense to anyone anyways. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, the last three movies. The underlying theology of the last three movies made little or no sense, right? Anyways, that's a whole nother. Maybe I'll teach the, the theology of Star Wars one day, okay? But you can't have a world that's built on dualism because the rabbis knew the world of dualism and they were opposed to it. So ancient dualisms commonly referred to are Gnosticism, Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism at the time of the Hechelot literature, around the time of the Mishnah, early Midrashim, where there is a belief that there is a, 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 a light, good, loving, creator God, and there is a dark, deep, hating, destroying creator God. And that the two gods are always in battle with each other over the saving or destroying of the earth the redeeming or the corrupting of the souls of men. God and the devil. The church has this in it, but they've made the devil subsumed somehow to the power of God by making the devil a fallen angel. So there's an angel of the heavenly courts created by God for divine purpose who has a fall of some kind, which is still subject to the authority and the power of God, right? And is out there both opposing God, but also playing God's needs. Because what does that power allow you to do? It allows you to overcome it as a good person, right? And the idea of overcoming evil becomes an essential part of the theology of the, of the meaning of life in a dualistic system. That the purpose of evil is for you to combat it, right? Some of that will find its way into the Kabbalah. And, and that's going to be next week's topic. Was what? I was saying that's in Gnosticism and that's in Zoroastrianism and some other non-Jewish religions. The rabbis knew those beliefs, hated those beliefs, opposed those beliefs, and did not want that present in Judaism. We have one God. There's no opposing God in Judaism. Period. There can't be. And so in the Talmud, in one of the early mystical paragraphs, you have four rabbis who enter the Pardes. And I mentioned this before, but what I didn't mention to you is that when they go in, Rabbi Akiva gives a warning to the other three. When you enter the Pardes, he says, go as far as the luminescent stone, whatever that is, and don't say maim, maim. That's all he says. That's understood to mean that if you are transmigrating your soul into the heavenly realm, you are not to see or proclaim a duality of any kind. Maim, maim. That would impose a duality in heaven. Imposing a duality in heaven is the ultimate sin. When Elisha ben Abuya has an experience with Metatron, the archangel, he implies to Metatron that something he's doing in, implies a dualism in heaven. And then Elisha ben Abuya becomes Acher, the, the prototypical heretic in the rabbinical system. That's the kernel of his turning to heresy. That's his move towards evil, implying a dualism in the heavens above. So once you split Keter into Chochmah and Bina, how is that not a dualism? So they have to really, it's more than one. So you have separation going on of some kind. So they have to insist that all of this is essential attributes of divinity. That we're seeing from our side of the coin, 
the Sifi wrote are how we are exposed to or shown attributes of the one united God. And so um, in the Eitz Chaim, by the way, you should know Luria n didn't write anything himself. He had a group of people who wrote everything. There are no books by Isaac Luria, by the RE. He wrote nothing. So uh, he's got a handful of students who write what he taught and they agree with each other 90% of the time, okay? So when he taught about creation, he talked about it in a couple of ways. One, let's talk about the overflow. The overflowing, he says as if there's an overflowing of Keter, which is essential to the Ein Sof, as if it opens a window from itself with no distance from Chochmah, and Chochmah receives from the window limitless, infinite overflow of Keter. So Keter can almost not bear holding all of Keter in itself and releases the pressure of its self-constraint because it can't constrain itself because of its infinite nature through what is metaphorically referred to as a window that overflows then into Chochmah. So Chochmah is, interestingly, filled of Keter. So is it Chochmah or is it Keter? Yes. It's Chochmah. It is filled and imbued by Keter. Constantly. And can't bear to hold itself in Keter and opens from itself a window, metaphorically, with no distance between it, to Bina. And Chochmah overflows to Bina. Meaning Bina is essentially imbued with Keter and Chochmah. Right? But now you have three. And Chochmah and Bina are neither Keter. And Chochmah and Bina have an overflow relation between themselves. And just like when you have two bodies of water and you connect them by a pipe, you really only have one body of water. Right? It's one contiguous body of water. And yet you can know these two are two. This is a pitcher and this is a jug connected by a pipe, but they are both essentially imbued by one body of water, and yet they are different. So are Chochmah and Bina. Yes. The right side is male attributes on the right, and the left side is female. By male and female in the in Kabbalistic system, we're talking about um, primarily being outwardly faced and or primarily being receptive of an outward face. And Cordovero uses the, the language of face, partsufim, to talk about the partsuf of Chokhmah, meaning the outwardly faced aspect of Chokhmah. Um, the reason why outwardly and receiving is male and female is because of the, the biology of genitalia, that the male is outwardly and the female is inwardly. The male is seminal and the female is nurturing, right, in those sense. That's a rough yes, that one side is male and the other side is female, but you also have things where the male is like, you know, do you really consider judgment, like justice, judgment, judging, a female attribute, or is that classically the God judge king attribute of maleness? So you kind of have, you know, where where are you gonna where are you gonna put that? So yes, we have Bina as understanding and as the first womb, right? A palace rather than a chariot, because the palace is defined by what's inside it, whereas the chariot is defined on where it goes, right? So that's more female that Bina would be female in that sense. So you do have this talked about as male on one side, female on the other, more active, more receptive. 
the right arm is on the right hand side, the left arm, which is understood as the weaker arm, the arm that holds things as opposed to the arm. Like it, when, you, when you feed the baby a bottle, if you're right handed, which arm is holding the baby and which arm is holding the bottle? You would think that love and grace is more female than male, but they associated it with Abraham and his tent and his feeding the strangers and his arguing for other people and saving lives. And Abraham was considered chesed. So the, 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 the progenitive father of Israel, who is also in this system, right, is male. And so chesed is male for that. Gevura is Isaac, who is more limited he is bound to the altar not the one who binds but the one who is bound in the binding of isaac he overflows towards tiferet which is jacob now all of these combine in tiferet in jacob because in jacob is all of the house of israel all the tribes are one in him all the sephirot are one in tiferet so there's this moment where it all comes back together again before it moves out. So all of the essence of Keter that is in Chochmah and all of Keter Chochmah in Bina and all of Keter Chochmah Bina in Chesed and all of Keter Chochmah Bina Chesed that is in Gevura, all five are in Tiferet, the sixth of the Sephirot. Okay. So it's really Chesed, Gevura, Tiferet, Netachod, Yesod, and Shekhinah, the bottom seven that are the ones that are essentially not connected to the first overflow of Keter Chalk Mabina. So Keter Chalk Mabina is considered like the highest three, and then you have the bottom seven. The bottom seven are the ones that we are most likely in our best moments to be able to activate, right? So you have prophecy in Netzach and prophecy in Hod. You have the covenant in Yesod and you have the Shekhinah in Malchut, the bottom one. Shekhinah can be experienced directly. Through Shekhinah, indirectly, you can experience covenant prophecy Glory of Teferit, Chesed, and Gevura, right? And then again, again, they, they, they use all this to reinterpret rabbinic literature. Ezehu Gibor, who is the Gibor? Akovesh et Yitzra, the one who, who can overcome his inclinations, right? So to, to be a Gevur, a Gibor, to exhibit Gevura means to overcome your inclinations. And you know how to do that because of the teachings of covenant and prophecy and the experience of all Israel in Tifer. That's what allows you to get to Gevura. And Chesed is the highest of the reachable ones. So, you know, why, why do the Chabadniks, why does everyone love the Chabadniks? I love the Chabadniks. The Chabadniks have played a very important part in my life. When I was at Syracuse and I was really becoming very serious about Jewish living and Jewish studying for the first time. I was already Jewish, had been for a while, but the, I really took it to another level. One of the guys was a conservative rabbi at Hillel. Another guy was a Chabad rabbi on campus, right? His door was open and I, and I learned that there's a place, if, if you're stuck anywhere in God's green earth and you, your car breaks down and you're stuck for Shabbos, your best bet, if you don't know anybody, is to find the local Chabad guy. You will have a home. You will have a meal. You will have davening, right? And they'll write you letters for the rest of your life, <laughs> right? But it's because they believe deeply in chesed, that chesed is the highest attainable human activation of divinity. So they are trained as shlichim to always greet you with that happy face. If you're a guy, the rabbi is going to give you a hug, right? I don't know if the Rebbitzin hugs the women or not, right? 
because chesed is there. And they have this whole, there's a whole mystical system called tikkun chatzot, where in many Hasidic traditions, where they get up in the middle of the night and they do a tikkun rachel and a tikkun leah where they, they, they do prayers about their, their chesed and their failings and to forgive anyone that they were angry at and to seek the love and the blessing of anyone that they can overflow that part of God towards. And right, the tikkun chatzot is a, is a, is a middle of the night uh, discipline of chassidut based in Kabbalah. Right. And in Hasidu, you have the Kabbalah system underlying every mitzvah, every family relationship, every hope for humanity. And what we're going to see next week when we talk about good and evil and why is there's a big payoff for doing all that. It also happens to make them, you know, really nice and generous people who have done tremendously good work to touch unaffiliated or marginal or questing Jewish souls you know, in a way that mainstream Judaism often does not. And God bless them for that. And like everybody else, they're not perfect. Right? Um, okay, let's, let's turn. Let's go a little deeper. Okay, so on the next page, you again see the system. And now Malchut has been properly placed at the bottom. Most halachic systems on the back of the first page We'll have the bottom sifira named Malchut. And the top right one, the first one that comes out from Keter, will be named Chokhmah. So you have Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, and the bottom is Malchut. That is the mainstream halachic understanding of the sifirot. It's not universal. And so coming out of the Ari, some of his students named them differently. And then some of them were the inspiration for different founders of Hasidic movements. And so as we mentioned before, if you turn to the next page where it says version two, you'll see the top one is no longer Keter, it's Chochmah. Keter has been subsumed into the Ein Sof in this understanding. And when you bump everything up, you got to add something somewhere, right? So when the Levites became a non-tribe, we needed to keep 12 tribes. So Yosef got split in half. Menashe and Ephraim making up the missing tribe. Okay, here when Keter became Ein Sof and Cholchma moved up, Bina became number two because the because the Ari was very clear that Bina is an overflow from Cholchma. Understanding comes from wisdom, and then the next one they added in here is Dad, knowledge. And this Cholchma Bina Dad in that order is the system that was articulated by Schneer Zalman of Liadi, the founding Rebbe of the Lubavitch movement, which is why they call themselves Chabad, Chochma Bina Da'ad. Okay? All right. We're going to skip some of these others. I, I kind of did this in the first class without showing it to you. Sefer Yitzira, Sefer Habahir. And all the way until you see a page that says Isaac Luria's creation myth. You're going to go about three or four more pages. If you want to read the texts in between, there are those early proto-Kabbalistic texts I talked about, the Sefer Yitzhara and the Sefer Abahir from the, the mid uh, 4th, 5th centuries and then the 10th, 11th centuries. Nancy, question? Truck, can't hear you. We, we've got music in the park and trucks driving by. So hang on. Ah, Shekhinah in the original system was called Malchut. So it wasn't that Shekhinah disappeared, it's that in some systems, the Malchut was associated with Shekhinah because Malchut was the kingdom which receives the rule of the king. So the Keter at the top is paired to the Malchut. The crown is compared to the kingdom and everything in between is the activity of the king that combines the authority of the crown with the kingdom where it's lived. And the kingdom down below where it's lived is what is in touch with the physical world. And so the, in other halakhic systems, the aspect of God that is in touch with the physical world is the part that is shochein, that dwells with us in the mishkan, in the sanctuary, which literally means the place of dwelling. Like a milon is the place where you put words 
a dictionary. A mishkan is the place of shokhain. It's a place of dwelling. So we experience the shekhinah in the place of dwelling. We experience malchut in the same place. So they conflated malchut and shekhinah. Malchut is a feminine word. Malchut gidola, grammatically. Um, but um, shekhinah is feminine because it is the receiving aspect of God. That's why it's feminine. Right. For us, we almost experience it as, in their system, masculine, in that it overflows towards us, and we would be the feminine. So the people of Israel would be feminine, receiving their beloved, which is why the allegory of Song of Songs works so well for the mystics, because we become the female shepherd girl, and the king on high loves us so much. And we are always seeking him, and we have lost our lover, which is us in exile. Right. Okay. All right. Isaac Luria and the creation myth. How are we doing? We good? People aren't dozing off. You got one of these? All right. So how do you get from the aim self into a world of particulars? So Isaac Luria in in chapter one, part one um, of the Eitz Chaim, written by uh, his, one of his great disciples, uh, Chaim, it's not Luzado, Chaim, Vital. I'll get it for you. Ah, Vital, thank you. I was blanking. Is that Jay? All right. Chaim Vital uh, wrote the Eitz Chaim. And in uh, chapter one, uh, he immediately just starts with the creation. And he talks about Keter and Ein Sof, really as if they're the same thing. And he, he goes through this concept of the overflowing and the windows. I took that straight from the Eitz Chaim, um, Bachaim Vital. There is a point, however, and Cordovero really does this uh, more explicitly than... Um, than the eight time where these vessels can no longer hold the divinity right and and we're going to see what happens with that but first let's go through how they overflow so the first thing that happens is is the keter ain so the infinite god has a process a, a, an activity that is referred to as sim tsum sim tsum means contraction and there's a huge debate in the followers of the ari who wrote this theology, who, who taught this theology, whether or not that should be understood entirely metaphorically or in any way physically. So picture a, an infinite Ein Sof. You can't. Now, picture that the infinite Ein Sof contracts itself, just like you tighten yourself when you inhale, right? You don't think about it, but you do. When you inhale, your diaphragm contracts, Right, all your stuff gets squished. But what does that squishing do? It creates space in the lungs, which the air then fills. Right? So you create a vacuum without changing yourself in any way whatsoever. And in that contraction, the Ain Self contracts itself towards, and he uses the word nikuda, a dot. A dot. So he contracts itself towards a dot. And in the contraction, where God, as it were, used to be, at least metaphorically, God is now not. And wherever the end of the infinite used to be is an infinite potential that is no longer in contact with the essential divinity that has now contracted. In contracting and leaving entirely outside itself, limitless potential, God has created the metaphorical space where these, the overflowing system of sifirot can occur. So in simtsum contraction, Keter immediately overflows like the squeezing of a sponge. The sponge is no different than it was. Imagine if a sponge could squeeze itself. 
and whatever is is from it can now be outside of it, although it would still be in contact with it. And that's the metaphor. Now, if you're using light, the metaphor is a window because light moves through a window. If you're using water, the metaphor is an overflowing fountain because water overflows the fountain. But the water that's in the top of the fountain, the middle of the fountain, and the bottom of the fountain is the same water. You haven't taken away the water, lessened it or increased it by causing it to overflow throughout the fountain. So the Tim Sum allows for the creation of the fountain, which now becomes full of the overflowing waters of God. That's the metaphor. Pause. Anybody weirding out on that? Confused, unhappy? <laughs> yes. Infinite creating infinite. Think, think about the expansion of the universe. Think, okay, us. We are the universe. We're a tiny piece of it. But think big. Think Hubble's telescope big, or I guess there's a new one, Wilson telescope, whatever it is, big. The universe, the universe is expanding into what? Is the universe expanding into something? Is there more space than there used to be? Is there less stuff than there used to be? Is there more stuff than there used to be? If matter is neither created nor destroyed and the universe is expanding, then what's 10 feet past the universe? And will we know in another million years? Now you have the metaverse where you can disappear inside yourself, which is actually really cool Kabbalistically because we also have within ourselves the complete system of the Sifri Road. So we can find all of that inside ourselves as well as outside of ourselves, which is why this Kabbalah and meditation is such a huge thing. We'll, we'll maybe get to that in the final session. But this metaphor of overflowing infinite is a paradox if it's physical. But if it's not physical, it's not a paradox, but it may be simply confusing. Like, how do you imagine something non-physical with a spatial metaphor? It's impossible. So if you're going to be a skeptic, which many academic students of Kabbalah are, you're going to say, and this is where they get you. Because once you buy that, you'll buy anything. Right? Which is why all philosophical theological systems have to explain creation. Right? Because if Sajjah Gowan said, because if God didn't create the universe, the whole system of religion falls apart. Now that may, Maimonides was hedging his, his bets. You can have a universe that's always here, perhaps. The universe of the philosophers. Doesn't mean there's not a God. So for the Kabbalist, the physicality of the universe and the presence of God is a much more important assertion than it is in any other system of Jewish thought. This connectedness of this overflowing imminent divinity and power in the physicality of the universe is, is, has to be dealt with because otherwise um, the, the whole system we're gonna see in the next two days of activity will make no sense. It is precisely the connectedness to the physicality that makes our physical lives so sacred and our mitzvot so important. And, and we'll get to that. So the overflow is a metaphor. Some of the Kabbalists made it not a metaphor. That there actually are sefirot um, that become what we call klipot. Okay. And this is where the physicality starts to come in. Just like in, and we're done with this packet, I think. Oh, I just showed you, um, I was just showing you in the last couple of pages, there are people who like to combine Judaism with Buddhism. There's a lot of Kabbalists who like to combine it with some of the, the Hindu style uh, chakras and, and life forces and the right hand and the left hand and the third eye and all that kind of stuff. And so I showed you how some people have used the human body of what's taken from the early language of uh, Adam Kadmon 
the primordial Adam who becomes the Sephirot, who has a Sephirot on these different body, body parts. And then you turn and I have a chart where someone has put it together with the chakras of Hinduism so that you can do yoga with the Sephirot and activating a different part of your body in yoga with the intention of activating that chakra. You're in fact activating that Sephiria and developing a closer relationship with God and divinity and power and all that. God bless you. It's not my thing. I see it. Um, I would say that somebody who does this is not being a heretic. Somebody who does this without the Sephirot is not doing Judaism. But if someone does this with the Sephirot, despite the fact that it's foreign to almost everything I do and believe in, I have to admit it's Judaism. They're doing Judaism. It's, it's, it's not a mitzvah-based Judaism. It's not a yeshiva-based Judaism but they're engaging in a text study and a spirituality that is connecting through Jewish terms and, and legitimate Jewish legacy to God in that system. I would hope they're still keeping kosher and davening three times a day. This isn't davening. This doesn't fulfill your obligation to say the Shema or put on tefillin. You still have to do those things would be my point of view. But if you're also doing this, I think you're still doing Judaism. But I'm not an expert in it. All right. Okay. With Tai Chi. Cool. They can do all this and kick you in the teeth. Um, okay. On the last page, you'll see a large chart where some people have also taken psychology of, of spirituality and connected it to the names of the Sifirot. Um, and so Chesed is kindness, Gavura becomes discipline, Tiferet is beauty. And they, they make them primary emotions and secondary emotions. Psychologists, you'll have to tell me whether or not these are legitimate categories or not. I have no idea. But they're dividing the, the supernal system and the initial overflow of God with Chochm and Bina and the seven lower sefirot, which we can all access and they're making their human emotions. It's all cool, right? It's cool, it's wild. You know what? This and a margarita on the beach for the afternoon sounds like a day well spent. <laughs> I don't know if the margarita or this came first, but no. But this is very real. I don't mean to make fun. I'm just making fun because it's funny, not because I'm trying to be mean. Um, and then you also see someone has done it with a more physiological interpretation on the last page where the Keter is literally the skull that holds the Keter. Chokhmah is the right brain, Bina is the left brain, Da'at is the central brain. I've never heard of a central brain before. Is that the Migdula? I don't know. Um, and then you have the right arm and the left arm. And then intentionality, externality, the right leg, the left leg, your sexual organs, and then your mouth, your speech, and so forth. Um, the truth is that in the creation story that results in the creation of the Sifirot and the Sifirot created either as a first step towards the overflow that then becomes light, meaning light emanates from Malchut, right? So that's one interpretation of this system in creation. Vayehi Ur, so the first God was Mirachefet all over everything and decided intentionally to overflow and organize the tohu and the vohu, which is reminiscent of battle imagery of ancient cosmological myths and has it all in order and says, let there be light is the overflow of that into the world. And then everything comes from Malchut, right? So the creation narrative can be understood in Kabbalah as coming from the Sefirot and the Sifirot then become the Kalim, the tools by which God creates all the variety below. And the reason everything comes out different below from the single unitary God above is because the differences of balance in the Sifirot are overflowing like you're shaking the stuff that's mixing in the water. When you shake your lemonade, you don't have the same amount of lemon in every ounce of the lemonade. And the more you shake it, it continues not to be evenly distributed. The concept that you have it, anything evenly distributed in a solution is you're fooling yourself. It's not. 
it averages to the same. So they're all there, but there's going to be something that's more sweet or more sour and so forth. And that that is the explanation of how things can be different as they fly out or flow out from Malchut in the creative process. Nancy. Evil is next week. Come on back. Everything here accounts for evil. Because the next step for next week is going to be, if we don't have dualism and we have evil, it must have come from God. How can that be? Right? How can all the terrible things that happen come from God? And for Maimonides, it's easy because everything that we experience as terrible is understood as a lack of the good, right? Darkness is the lack of light. Illness is the lack of health. It's not that illness is sent to you, but there is a lack of health in that aspect of physicality, right? As opposed to if you think evil is a thing that God creates and sends, then you can have a theology that God sends illness, which I think is terrible and it's horrific and never ugh, ew, poo. <laughs> Just contrary. But that would be a logical way to develop a system that has evil coming from God. So we're going to see in the Kabbalah, there's a mix of that. It's neither just the absence of light, nor is it independent evil. There's going to be an essential aspect to it that different Kabbalistic systems are going to deal with differently as far as what does it mean to have evil? Does evil have a purpose? And what is our purpose in relation to evil? Those three questions are, are essential. Um, yes. I have to let the people online know what you're saying. There's a corpus callosum, kind of like a central brain between the left and the right that communicates between the two. <laughs> so corpus, corpus callosum is an aspect of the brain that develops in one's 20s, uh, uh, typically in a, in a normal development, I'm being told, and that it mitigates between the left and the right brain. So for that to be da'at, mitigating between chokhmah and bina, or uh, would, would be an interesting interpretation. So that, that was shared in the day. Okay, uh, let's finish with a song as we did last time. This time we're going to do Yadid Nefesh. Yadid Nefesh is an introductory psalm for Kabbalat Shabbat. Kabbalat Shabbat was introduced to the Friday evening prayers by the school of Isaac Luria. It was not there for the rabbis. The rabbis would say the psalm for Shabbat, the psalm for Friday, Baruch Hu, Shema, Amidah, and go home. We sing Yadid Nefesh, six psalms, plus Lecha Dodi, plus those other things. And we sing, uh, and all of that usually takes longer than the actual Shema Amidah and Kaddish. So we spend most of our time, whoops, I need this one. Um, okay, I want us to look at Yedid Nefesh. You should Google it online, Yedid, Y-E-D-I-D, -E Nefesh, and look at the words. Obviously, the fact that it begins with Nefesh should tell you this is a spiritual song. In other words, it's talking about the soul. It's talking about those kinds of things. And let's look at the language. Uh, av Arachaman. If you had to say Rachaman in a Sifira, which one would it be? What would an Av, a father, be in the Sifirot? Which Sifira is that? Probably Keter. Maybe Keter Chochmabina together. Right? And then... Uh, so your Av, Keter Chokmabina, of Arachaman, which is Chesed. So in the first sentence, you've got the first four Sifirot, Av Arachaman. Mesholch Avdecha El Ritzonecha. Pull your servant towards your Ratzon, towards your will. Remember, the creation story was Ein Sof Keter exhibiting its will for creation. Right, And so God willed it, and we are your servant. So God is willing us, and we are willing to return to that will. Right? 
So this is the connectedness of the divine system with us. Your servant will her Yarutz Abdecha Kamo Ayal Yishtachavat Mul Hadarach. I will uh, bow before your Hadar. Hadar is Hod. Your Hod, another one of the Sifirot. Ki Yerav Lo Yedidu Tach. Um, I, I will. I'm your Yedid. I am your beloved, and you are mine. Minofetzu Fechol Ta'am. From the dripping of the honeycomb and its taste. So, um, ta'am is a pun for a reason as well as a taste. Ta'am ha mitzvot are the reasons for the mitzvot. Ta'am is also the taste of something. So, there's a pun here. What's the pun about? It's about the nofet tzuf. The tzuf is a honeycomb. Guess what is the honeycomb? The sifirot are the honeycomb. There are multiple, um, because of its shape, it's shaped like a honeycomb. And so that's used in a lot of their literature as a metaphor. Hadur na'e ziv ha'olam. You're the spark, which we're going to see in Luriana Kabbalah next week, that when we talk about the physical manifestation of good, and it also gets encompassed with evil in physicality, and you have spirit and physicality as, as goodness and badness. We have a ziv is the spirit that's within the physical, the spark. So majestic is the spark in the universe or the spark of the universe. If there are sparks in the universe that come from God, then God is in fact the spark of the universe. Okay, hadur na'e ziv ha'olam. My soul is sick in love with you. Right? This is like Shakespearean. So please heal me of that sickness of my love of you. In showing her, now we've made my soul female, meaning my soul is akin to Shekhinah and Malchut. Noam Zivach the pleasantness of your overflow or your sparks, right? Which is also the male sefirot overflowing to the female sefirot. Az tit chazek v'tit Now, um, you should become strengthened and you should become healed. And in the tzimtzum, what I didn't get to because we're going to do it with the creation of evil next week, when everything gets so full of all this divinity, you can't hold it anymore. And there's a belief in one of the Kabbalistic systems that those kalim, those vessels full of holiness, sefirot and, or whatever they are, physical, physically and, and metaphysically, they shatter. They can't hold anymore. And that's called shvirata kalim, the shattering of the vessels of the creation. And the, the, the shattered remnants of those vessels are what make up the physical universe within which are trapped divinity. And we're going to talk about that next week. Healing that shattering is one of the purposes of the Kabbalah life. So you shall be strengthened. You shall be healed. And my soul will have eternal joy or the rejoicing of the universe. It's another pun. So when I fix the universe or my soul reaches eternity, those things happen at the same time. There's this kind of quickening of redemption. May your mercy be aroused. I want your, your chesed and your rachamim to be activated. Because I've been because it has yearned and I have yearned. And there's a, there's a sexuality to the sefirot with each other and with me. There's a yearning to be combined with them. To see through Tiferet, the one in the middle where all of the Sefirot come together. Uh, don't hide yourself. Let my heart be desired. Okay, finally, reveal yourself. So it's like all this hiddenness in the shattered vessels and the hiddenness of you on high in the Sephirot. Reveal your, yourself. At Sukkot Shlomecha, Sukkot Shlomecha is the, the sukkah of your peace and your well-being. 
which is also the sukkah of the messianic kingdom. Sukkah David Anofelet. Ta'ir Eretz Mikvodecha, and the earth will fill, be full of your glory. And we will, Nagila Venis Mechabach, we will rejoice. Maher Ahuv, quickly, my beloved, come, because it, now is the time. Chaneni, Chanenu, show us gross, show us grace, Kime Olam, like the eternal years of the universe, or like days of old. Right? So this is a deeply Kabbalistic song, which most people just get it like Shira Shirim. When you read it, it's a love song between us and God. But it goes deeper than that, and we should sing it. <laughs> Avarachaman Meshokavdach El Ritzonecha Yarutavdach Kemo Ayal Yishtachave Mulhadarecha Ki Yeravlo Yedidu Techa Mino Fetsuf Vecho Taam Adurna E Ziv Haulam Nav Shicholat Avatecha Ana Elna Refana La Behar Otla No Am Zivach as tid chazek v'tid rape v'hai talach tzim chat olam v'tik yehemu rachamecha v'chusna al ben ohadcha kizet kama nitzov nitsa. Lero peti feret uhu zecha ana eli machmad libi kusana vealti talam iga aleina ufros chavivi alai et sukat shelomecha ta'ir eret mikvodecha na'agila v'nismecha b'ach ma'her ahuv kiva mo'ed v'chaneni kime olam and then we go yada dai 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 yada dai 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 which is the nigun that allows your soul to to go to those places without the words. That's today's lesson. We'll be on next week. We'll do klipot. We'll do the, the, the shells of the vessels, the hidden sparks. We'll do sitra atra, achra, the, the, the alternate or the evil influence inside. Yetzirah tov, yetzirah ba, and uh, the battle with good that results in Mashiach. That's all next week. <laughs> Questions online, anybody? No, I hope you enjoyed today's class. Bevakasha. Join us in the park. It's lovely out here. Not too not too hot. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, okay. <laughs>